This podcast is brought to you by the Albany Public Library main branch and the generosity of listeners like you. What is a podcast? God, Daddy, these people talk as much as you do. Razib Khan's unsupervised learning. Hey, everybody. I am here with a very special guest this time um, that I think a lot of the listeners to this podcast will know ahead of time. I'm here with Dr. David Anthony. David, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, I am now uh, affiliated with the David Reich's Ancient DNA Lab uh, at Harvard University in Human Evolutionary Biology, and uh, I am retired from teaching 30 years at Hartwick College. Uh, I'm currently working on a book to follow up uh, my a book from 13 years ago, The Horse, the Wheel, and Language. Yeah, and so, David, uh, before we got on the call, you know, I've been emailing you, and one thing that I have been saying is uh, I'm writing a, a series on the steppe, which actually is going to go over into the Mongol period and perhaps later, and I'm rereading your book as part of it for the Indo-European section. And, uh, you know, I'm going to tell the listeners out there, I think a lot of it ages well. Obviously, there's going to be some changes due to the ancient DNA revolution of the last five to ten years. But, um, you know, before before Dr. Anthony comes out with the next book, I recommend the listeners to go out and get the, you know, horse wheel language because there's a lot in there that I think will clarify and um, just kind of scaffold a lot of the ancient DNA that is really, really uh, getting thrown at us right now. And I have to say, um, you know, retiring and then, being affiliated with David Wright's lab, that's, that's pretty awesome. Like, what, what, how do you feel about that? Oh, I feel great. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. I mean, when you're, when you're teaching at a liberal arts college, you, you do a lot of teaching, and it cuts into your research time. And since 2018, the last, last couple of years, I've been freed uh, from that job, and uh, now I can just dedicate myself to uh, solving the problem of Indo-European origins and um, clarifying a lot of issues in steppe archaeology. So it's it's a lot of things are coming together now. I have I'm a co-author on four papers that are in review at Nature now uh, at the same time. So there are many different projects that are uh, coalescing now around this central set of uh, questions. Well, so I want to start um, by asking, how did you get interested in Indo-Europeans? It was an accident, like many things in life. You know, I I uh, when when I was a teenager. I was really fascinated with the Inca Empire. And uh, when I got into college, I wrote many papers for different kinds of courses using material from the Incas. Uh, And when I applied to graduate school, they wanted me to demonstrate that I could be broader than that. And so I looked through the library and pulled some books off the shelf and wrote a paper about um, the Indo-European problem, the archaeology of Indo-European origins. And that was the beginning of my subsequent career, although at the time I thought I was just showing them that I could be broader than just the Incas. Uh, that, that, that's fascinating. Uh, so what year was that? Oh, boy, that was 1971. A uh, long, long time ago. And uh, once I started reading about it, I realized that uh, the problem of Indo-European origins, it's one of the greatest unsolved problems in Western intellectual history. People have been working on this uh, literally for 200 years. Uh, and uh, it got politicized um, by the Nazis uh, in the early 1900s and, and uh, World War II. And because of what they did with their polit- uh, political usages of this piece of prehistory in order to promote their theory of, you know, Aryan supremacy, um, they used uh, prehistoric migrations as a rationale for a conquest in the present. Uh, but so, so that put Hall, a uh, dark cloud, over the entire subject matter. And after World War II, most uh, scholars stayed away from the subject because of what had happened. Uh, but I realized that when I was a when I was a college student that um, that wasn't necessary. You know that that kind of political misuse of of the past is was not inevitable, and we could come back to this problem, which remains unsolved, and 
and try to uh, uh, approach it uh, with new evidence and with uh, better archaeology and with better theories. And when I started, an awful lot of people kind of looked at me, gave me the side eye, you know, because of the uh, political history of, of the whole question. Um, but it has certainly become uh, more and more a uh, central subject of research in European archaeology, and, and now it's, it's, it's a really big deal. Yeah, so as I'm rereading uh, your, your 2007 book, uh, it's interesting. You mentioned uh, instances in the 80s and 90s where you yourself, but uh, to, to maybe a larger extent because of her prominence than Maria Gimbutas, uh, the famed Lithuanian-American archaeologist who proposed the Kurgan hypothesis or the idea that Kurgans migrated, the Kurgan people, as she called them, migrated out of the Pontic Steppe uh, into old Europe, uh, these Neolithic societies. And there were some skeptics of this idea, uh, and I can get a sense just reading at it, reading it, uh, that they basically scoffed at her. And, you know, you were around then. Uh, are these people still around? Like, what are they saying right now? Yeah, so Maria Gimbutas has, has been used as a in, – in, a, in American and Western European graduate programs in archaeology – uh, for the past 30 years, Maria Gimbutas has been used as an object lesson on how not to do archaeology. Um, and uh, she had huge migrations, grand migrations, going from hither to yon, uh, in her theories, the Kurgan culture of migration. Uh, and uh, she was proposing these migrations at a time when migration itself uh, was going out of favor in Western archaeology. Uh, before World War II, migration was used as the explanation for every episode of culture change. You know, if the pottery changed from red pottery to black pottery, then that was a migration of the black pottery people. Um, and after, in the 1960s, uh, Western archaeology moved towards really explicitly scientific theories of, of culture change and the, began to investigate the myriad internal causes of culture change, uh, economic uh, causes and um, uh, climatic causes and uh, ideological causes. And migration was thrown out the window as usually just a simplistic and often uh, mistaken uh, kind of explanation. Maria's uh, theories depended entirely on massive migrations. Um, and really the, the, the sin of migration theory that has been developed in Western archaeological theory is that migrations were being used to explain the origins of modern nations, and this is what the, this is what the Nazis were doing. They were, they were tracking a prehistoric culture and bringing it up and making it the ancestors of the modern Germans. Uh, and, and, um, and so using migration in that way was connected with modern European nationalism. Uh, and approaching the past the way Maria Gimbutas did has been used in Western universities as an object lesson in how those kinds of simplistic theories uh, result in nationalistic um, interpretations of the past. And uh, starting in the uh, 1990s, I began to uh, publish articles in which I was proposing looking at migration in a completely different way. And I'm still fighting about this. Um, I think that uh, there are a lot of uh, Western archaeologists who are completely surprised by the genetic evidence showing that there were actually <laughs> massive migrations. Um, not exactly the same ones that Maria uh, described. She was wrong about some of the archaeological cultures she thought were coming from the steppes. But definitely the, uh, the Yamnaya culture uh, from the steppes uh, dated a little bit before 3000 BC to about 2500 BC has been shown to have migrated from the steppes north of the Black and Caspian Seas westward into Europe and eastward all the way to the Altai Mountains, a, a range of about 6,000 kilometers across um, Western Europe and all of Europe and, and the heart of Central Asia. Um, and no one really uh, is questioning those migrations now. Uh, and so one of the things that I hear at conferences is, oh, my God, was Maria right? <laughs> Said kind of nervously. Uh, 
And I don't think she was exactly right. Uh, she was wrong in a number of details, and her theories of migration were extremely simplistic, where culture A moves across a uh, large space and totally replaces culture B. Um, and she would describe migrations as waves, uh, which are phenomena that have no thought or target or uh, plan, whereas really what migrants tend to do uh, in prehistory and, and in modern, uh, in the modern world, is they, they move in streams rather than waves towards very targeted destinations, and they go destinations because they have information about them, and migration follows information streams. Those information streams can be sometimes correlated with shared material culture, and so you might be able to, in, in my approach, pick up these very targeted information streams that were the uh, vector through which information came and, and, and informed the people in the SEPs about um, uh, attractive destinations, and they went to those specific places. Uh, so I, I would like to see the migrations recast in a, in a more sophisticated way rather than just a block moves from the steppes and replaces another cultural block somewhere in Central Europe. So I think she was wrong about her models of migration too, but she was right about some some major issues. Uh, yeah, and you know, um, you know, before we go into it, I think like, you know, a lot of listeners will know what a Kurgan is, know who the Yamnaya is, but I do feel like I should probably define some of these. Or actually, uh, can you define what a Kurgan is? Because a lot of people um, who are listening are going to be thinking about the Highlander movies, which I find really frustrating on Google searches. So can you, talk, can you tell the listeners what a Kurgan is? <laughs> it's not the Highlander movies. Uh, yeah, so uh, um, a Kurgan is really just an earthen burial mound. And there's a, a period of time, uh, the beginnings of this culture, the Yanaya culture, which is the culture of the pit graves, uh, and these, these, there were there were pits dug in the ground like a modern grave, and then covered with uh, burial mounds. Uh, and the body was arranged in a very specific way. And the bottom of the grave, uh, red ochre was put in in a very specific way. And there's specific kinds of artifacts that were included in these graves that identify the archaeological culture called Yamnaya or the pit grave culture uh, in English. And uh, uh, the Amnaya culture appears archaeologically uh, kind of suddenly around 3100, 3200 BC and just sweeps across the, uh, this funeral ritual, sweeps across the steppes uh, north of the Black and Caspian Seas and uh, constitutes a archaeological material break with the uh, cultures that had been there uh, earlier. Uh, and I think that the, the dynamics that led to the expansion of the Yamnaya culture were, and this is uh, indicated in the title of my uh, book, The Horse Wheel and Language, uh, that uh, first, uh, horses were domesticated in the steppes where they exist in large numbers uh, in the wild, um, or existed um, in 3000 BC. Uh, and then wagon technology was introduced to the steppes probably from the outside. I think wagons were probably invented outside the steppes, but they were introduced to the steppes right at the beginning of the Amnaya period. And when people who were already riding horses acquired these wheeled vehicles, it made possible the uh, invention of a nomadic form of economy. And uh, it was the first um, pastoral uh, pastoral referring to uh, uh, relying on herds of animals for your food uh, rather than farming. So yeah. they were pastoral nomads. Uh, and uh, the pastoral nomads of the Eurasian steppes are very well known to probably most of <laughs> your listeners uh, in the yeah. form of Huns and Mongols. Uh, the beginnings of pastoral nomadism in the Eurasian steppes are uh, is the subject of great archaeological debates. And I think that it was the invention of pastoral nomadism, an entirely new kind of economy, uh, that made possible the Yamnaya expansion. And the reason was this. Um, if you look at the ecology of the 
uh, steps north of the Black and Caspian Seas, what's today Ukraine and southern Russia. Uh, there are big rivers running through the steppes, um, surrounded by grassland. And prior to the Yamnaya period, all the people who lived in the steppes lived in those river valleys. Uh, and the river valleys were uh, like ribbons of high resources. They, in the bottomlands, in the river valleys, there were forests. You know, they could be five kilometers wide um, and hundreds of kilometers long. But it's a very restricted, uh, although productive, environment. And in that environment, people were fishing uh, from the rivers and hunting deer. Uh, aurochs, the, the, the primitive ancestor of the uh, modern cattle, which is now extinct, uh, the, a variety of wild game, and all of their cemeteries, all of their settlement sites were located in the river valleys. Between the river valleys were these vast grasslands that were unused. And by inventing pastoral nomadism, the Yamnaya people invented a way of exploiting uh, and extracting the bioenergy from uh, these vast grasslands in the Eurasian steppes that were between the river valleys. Um, and uh, they did that by simplifying their economy down to just a few domesticated animals, the meat and milk from a few domesticated animals, cattle, sheep, goats, and horses. Um, their wagons were probably pulled by oxen because they were, the earliest wagons were very heavy and clumsy vehicles, but, but they could hold a couple of tons of uh, material which made it possible to have a mobile home and to leave the river valleys and carry all those resources of the river valleys, the water, the firewood, uh, food, tents, shelter, everything you needed could be put in a wagon and then you could become mobile and follow your herds. And at that point, you could have much, much larger herds uh, because with um, all of the Eurasian grasslands open to you, which had been previously unexploited, you had a much larger pasture available to you than anybody had before. But in order to have large herds, if you don't fodder them, if you don't give them fodder, you've got to keep them moving because they eat up the grass wherever they are. And so mm -hmm. uh, you had enough animals to use them for politics. Uh, you had a surplus of animals that could be used for loans and gifts and feasts. Um, but in order to maintain that surplus, you had to keep these herds moving, and that's what the wagon and horseback riding together uh, made possible. So that's the co combination of things that I think was responsible for the beginnings of the Yamnaya culture, and they invented a new form of mobility, much, much more mobile than anybody had been before, and they took it to the nth degree uh, right away. I mean, that's one of the big surprises of the genetics is that we have uh, Naya individuals who are buried in the Altai Mountains uh, on the edges of Mongolia and China um, uh, in the east, and Yamnaya individuals who are buried in eastern Slovakia on the west. Those two points are 4,000 kilometers apart. The um, equivalent distance is uh, San Francisco to, to Boston. Uh, and uh, who, are, who are related to each other and share a common ancestor five to six generations back, say 150 wow. to 200 back. And yeah. there, there are ones in the Altai uh, and ones in eastern Slovakia, and they, they share a common great-great-great-grandfather. Uh, it's it, it is astounding how mobile they were. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, it's uh, that's one of that's one of the biggest surprises. Um, so you know you're talking about nomadism, and pastoralism, and so just to make it clear for the listener, pastoralism or like agro pastoralism, domesticated animals existed before. But what David is getting across here is the Yamnaya switched purely to relying on animals and became totally nomadic, and we take that for granted today as a lifestyle that people practiced for thousands of years. But, David, are you arguing that they were the first to do this? Yes, I am. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm arguing. They invented okay. pastoral nomadism, and it was the combination of um, uh, heavy transport in wagons and light transport on horseback 
that made that combination possible. And Eurasian nomads throughout history and prehistory have depended on those two things, uh, horseback riding and wagons. Yeah, and, and you know, like, let, let's get to the horses. People are going to are gonna ask me to ask you, um, you know, and I've been looking into this literature, and it's still highly disputed about the bow tie horses. So the bow tie are people in uh, northern Kazakhstan, um, and, you know, they're more like ancient North Eurasian population, more Siberian, Paleo-Siberian. Um, they're a little different. Uh, they're considerably different probably than the Yamnaya. And so there's this argument about the domestication of horses. And, you know, I've read, like I've read a book a couple of times now. So, um, you know, I know that you're a believer and you just said it, like they domesticated horses. They rode on horses. And we don't have the bit because they probably didn't use the metal bit, which dates to later. There's all these like debates in archaeology. Like what is your, like, way you convince people who are skeptical about the horse domestication issue. Okay, so they, they have a right to be skeptical. Um, and uh, that was the very first thing that I um, attacked. Um, Dorcas Brown, my, my wife, and, uh, and I have been working on this together uh, for decades. Uh, but as a graduate student, the first thing I took on was horse domestication because it's such a critical part of the puzzle. We approached it by looking for uh, traces, microscopic traces of wear on horse teeth from bits. Um, and that's, uh, we, we're fairly confident in our results, but not everybody is. It's, it's a debated subject. So what has to happen um, uh, in the future and is beginning to happen now, and is, is some of these things are in re some of these studies that are in review right now, and I can't talk about them in detail. Um, but we have to look more at the Yamnaya people. There's a lot of Yamnaya human skeletons and not very many Yamnaya horse remains. I mean, when you get horse remains in Yamnaya graves, it tends to be symbolic. It's a it's one phalange. It's it's a hoof bone. Uh, lower a lower leg bone, uh, and uh, that's not going to tell you a lot about uh, the morphology of the horse or its, or, or even its uh, genetics. Uh, so we should be looking at the people. Uh, people who ride regularly exhibit pathologies in their lower back and in their uh, pelvis and in their uh, upper legs and knees that are uh, a pretty typical uh, rider's syndrome. Uh, and there's work going on that right now uh, to detect that kind of pathology in Yamnaya uh, human skeletons. So that's one way of looking at horse domestication. Um, uh, and another way is to look at horse DNA. And again, there's a big study looming, <laughs> which I can't talk about in detail, uh, of horse DNA. And, the previous studies, as you mentioned, there's this site, Bataille, in uh, northern Kazakhstan, which was investigated by lots of Western scholars, largely because there's a very large collection of horse bones there, more than 300,000 bones. So you can do good statistics on it. Um, and the claim has been made that the Bataille horses were domesticated uh, in 3500 BC. Um, but um, genetic research has already shown and been published that the Bataille horses are not related to modern domesticated horses. They're a separate lineage related to Perzwalski horses. Um, and there's another genetic study of horses in Western Europe focusing on Spain uh, that looked to see were they related to Neolithic horses, were they related to modern domesticated horses, and they're not related either. Uh, and then there's another study of uh, really uh, mitochondrial DNA in horses from Anatolia, and that established that the Anatolian horses are not the sources of modern domesticated horses. So uh, by a process of elimination, we've come down pretty much to the Pontocaspian steppe, uh, where horses are very abundant uh, in pre yamnaya settlement sites, um, uh, where you can get DNA from uh, horses. and. Here's, here's the problem with using genetics to identify domesticated horses. Um, let's say we have uh, uh, four horses that are A, B, C, and D. And D is fully domesticated, modern-looking horse. And A is definitely a wild horse. Uh, and the genetics show that there is an evolution from A 
through B through C to D. Uh, what do you do with the seahorse? It's not the same package of genetic changes that's in modern domesticated horses, but it's closer to modern domesticated horses than it is to wild horses. Is that a domesticated horse? And, and for those horses, you have to look at archaeological evidence. Um, you have to look at the relationship between the horses and humans as it's revealed in graves and in settlements. Uh, so uh, the, the genetic evidence can tell us when D appears first, you know, the exact same package of uh, genetic changes that you see in modern domesticated horses, but it can't really tell you about the intermediate stages, whether they're domesticated or not. So even after the DNA evidence comes out, I think we're still going to be arguing about the horses that are in between genetically. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I want to move on from the horse thing because I think, uh, you know, obviously there's only so far we can go before these papers come out. But uh, I, I do have to say um, the genetic evidence uh, is is very persuasive to me because I can evaluate it. And the rate of expansion of these Yamnaya people I'm just having a hard time imagining how this is going to happen just in ox carts. So uh, to me, it just seems like, a, and you know, I've said this and I will say this in the future, like, you know, whatever comes out in terms of the publications, I'll update my views, obviously, if there's a falsification, but it's just really weird how they exploded really fast. Like, it, it can't, yeah. I mean, maybe it's just luck, but like, it seems like this is like evidence where we need to figure out, like, what the mechanism is. And it's got to be a big deal. And horse domestication is a big deal. And, you know, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence here. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you completely. Um, they're just moving too fast. Um, and also, uh, something that most people aren't aware of, even archaeologists, is that the pre amnion sites that were located in the river valleys in the steppes, um, where there's plenty of settlement evidence. So people were living at these sites long term, and they're stratified. There's... There's one camp on top of another camp on top of another camp in the same place, pre Yamnaya. All those places are abandoned when Yamnaya starts, and uh, you can't find evidence of settlements at all uh, east of the Don River, the eastern part of the Yamnaya Range. Western part of the Yamnaya Range, there are a few settlements which are really interesting and important to excavate, but again, most of the pre Yamnaya settlements are abandoned. Uh, even in the western part of the Omnia range. And that, again, indicates they're really moving a lot. You know, if you can't find where they're living, uh, that means they're so mobile, they're, they're not staying in one place long enough to leave a substantial amount of garbage behind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I want to get to the genetics. Uh, yeah. I, I want to know what, how you reacted to it. And this is like literature. And as you know, I, I'm, you know, I have Nick Patterson, Patterson on the podcast. Like we've been talking about the Indo-Europeans, by me and him for, for, for years now. Um, so I think there's a lot to talk about, but I do want to ask, like I had Thomas Ollender um, on, on the podcast to talk about linguistic phylogenies. And so I just want to ask you, you're an archaeologist, you know, I don't think, I mean, you're trained as an archaeologist, so it's somewhat different, but I, I wonder like your general sense of the confidence in the various uh, phylogenies being presented. So, you know, some people argue for kind of a star phylogeny, a star-shaped phylogeny, or a rake where there's no internal structure, and other people say there's structure, aside from the Indo-Iranian, which is very clear, you know. Uh, do you think that, for example, it is a valid phylogeny to place the Balto-Slavic closer to the Indo-Iranian vis-a-vis, uh, say, Italo-Celtic? Um, I think most people accept that Hittite, Nashite, um, Anatolian is an outgroup, but aside from that, I think there's still a lot of dispute. Like, do you have, like, uh, opinions on those sorts of questions? Yeah, I, th I think I, I think there is a, a kind of a standard phylogeny emerging. There's a lot of debate about the details. But, yeah, the Anatolian languages, Hittite uh, principle among them, were, were the first to break off. And then, according to some people, there's Tocharian breaks off next. Um, and then there's a series of debate uh, breaks after that. But um, it used to be thought uh, that uh, Italic and Celtic were completely separate, and then other people thought that they were there was an Italo-Celtic phase. There's more and more support for an Italo-Celtic phase now. Um, I do think that the Balto-Slavic and uh, its connection with Indo-Iranian is um, 
it, it's uh, supported right now by a lot of evidence. It's not definite, but it's supported by a lot of evidence. And so uh, I would I would accept that. Um, uh, okay. I think I yeah. I think the phylogeny is not bad. I mean, the, it, it's gotten a lot more agreement than say 30 years ago. Uh huh. I mean, well, we have, you know, as I talked to Tom, we have, we have folks better computational methods, right? So instead of yeah. just people arguing and, and yelling at each other, <laughs> you could actually like go over their algorithms or their input data. And the, I think that the arguments that are being had are at least substantive in terms of should you use lexicon, should you use morphology, like these sorts of issues, which, you know, I've discussed on this podcast before, and I think those listeners know what I'm talking about there. Um, I want to move to the genetics because it's just crazy. Uh, like, in terms of, like, reading your reading your book, um, and I read it when it came out, or, like, in 2008, um, and, like, how much we know about the genetics and the fine-grained detail is just incredible, and I think that's one of the best things about rereading the horse, the wheel, and language is, you have this in a pre-genetic sense, so it's almost like you presented all these hypotheses, all these ideas out there uh, before you knew the genetic data, and the genetic data kind of tested a lot of it, right? Yes, yeah, and the genetic data has, has backed it up a lot uh, also. It, it has, although I do have to say um, uh, the extent of – so just for the listener who doesn't know, like Hawk et al. and like the Willis Lab paper in 2015, a couple of papers came out that looked at Indo-European replacement hypothesis basically from the Pontic step. And um, they found that the corded ware uh, culture of northern, northeastern Europe that dates to uh, – overlaps with the Yamnaya, um, and as you indicate, uh, is actually genealogically related to the Yamnaya. Like Dick Patterson confirmed that they, they have found genealogical, not just genome-wide admixture similarities. Uh, this corded ware culture in Europe uh, – it, it's like 75 – the initial individuals are like 70, are 75 percent Yamnaya. I mean, that's a little high, don't you think? I mean, was that your first reaction? Like, is this is this right? Absolutely. That was my first reaction. I didn't expect 75 percent. I expected a little. So the migrations were bigger, and their, their impact, their demographic impact um, on the previous populations of Europe was stronger than I suggested in the horse wheel and language. Um, I, I wasn't going big enough. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, I don't think anybody was. Yeah, no, but no, no one was. Um, I, I, so I, I've talked to Yusuf Lazaridis about this, I think, because he saw some of the early plots, and I, I think he just said, like, are we, are we sure about this? Uh-huh, yeah, but, but yeah, I think we are. I, there, are <laughs> there are papers that are in review now that um, uh, that I've seen that, that are trying to suggest alternate ways of getting um, uh, Yamnaya ancestry into uh, Northern and Western Europe, in the Corded Ware specifically, without Yamnaya being there. But it's, it's a very labored argument. Uh, Yamnaya yeah. has, has three components, you know, uh, Eastern hunter-gatherer, Caucasus gatherer, and Anatolian farmer, or European farmer. And uh, if you take those three apart and you try to get them into um, northern and central Europe, into the corded ware culture separately, then you could argue that there was no Yamnaya migration. It just looked like there was one. But that's a, it's an extremely labored and, um, uh, to me, unlikely uh, series of events that would have to happen. Yeah. Well, I mean, don't you think, uh, don't you think the, the genealogical evidence, which I'm sure you're privy to, and Nick Patterson did confirm to me, uh, yeah. Don't you think that that would falsify? I mean, that's not yeah, necessary. Like, if, you, if if you're someone's great grandson, you're someone's great grandson. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, I would say the biggest surprise to me from uh, the Yamnaya genetics is number one, and this is this is already uh, known based on published data, um, the homogeneity of Yamnaya. Um, is the first big surprise. I mean, the, the, genetically, the, they're extraordinarily uh, homogeneous, much more so than I would have expected looking at the archaeology, uh, because um, although they have very homogeneous genetics and very homogeneous rituals, funeral rituals, the other aspects of their material culture are, are variable across the Pontic Caspian steppes. You know, if you look at the pottery that's in their graves, there's a lot of pre-Yamnaya pottery types that continue right up into Yamnaya. You know, and there's a different type on the Volga yeah. than there is on the Dnieper. 
and archaeologists have pointed this out for years, that there's a lot of heterogeneity in Yamnaya material culture. But that's in the background of extremely homogeneous genetics and uh, funeral rituals. Uh, and I'm trying to square these observations to put together the fact that they're uh, surprisingly homogeneous genetically, which means that they've gone through a bottleneck. There's, there, is a, there is a bottleneck at the origin of Yamnaya or just before the origin of Yamnaya uh -huh. that we have to explain. Okay, um, so 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 let, let's talk about like your uh, your assumptions, your priors on this then, because I'm actually really curious because I I did notice that too. So it, it looks like a pemictic random mating population, right? That's what we would say. Like there's not not that much inter individual variation. You don't see long segments of say, you know, Cox's hunter gatherer versus you know like they look like they're mixed. Okay, so we know that. About how many Yamnaya were there on the Pontic step, step that were expanding? Like you know. 5,000 years ago. I mean, what's, what's, I don't know the ecology. I don't know the ecological dem demography. Like, I mean, what's your estimate? Well, I've been uh, – that's a good question. That's an excellent question. And I think that um, this new method, uh, IBD, uh, might help us to reconstitute population size. But yeah. the, the, the problem is that you start with a – you have to start with a relatively small localized population because – this bottleneck that produces the Yamnaya homogeneity. And then there's growth after that. The question is how much growth is there? Um, uh, but we may not be seeing the whole population. Um, here, here are the possibilities, you know, that um, if, if there is a, uh, a genetic, a demographic bottleneck at or just before uh, the beginnings of Yamnaya, it could be caused by epidemic disease, and there's evidence for that. Your line the black the Black Death, um, is is documented earliest in in Yamnaya individuals. Um, it could be caused by severe losses in warfare. That would imply really chronic, uh, continuous warfare just at the opening of the Yamnaya culture, or it could be caused by a social mechanism in which a very limited elite group took total control of all Kurgan variants. And there's actually a wider, more diverse, genetically more diverse population there, maybe helping to build the Kurgans, but it's only people who belong to a particular clan who get buried in a Kurgan. And when you when you look at Yamnaya graves, you have to realize that it's uh, already uh, clear uh, that we're missing a large part of the Yamnaya population. Even if the whole population was buried under Kurgans, we're missing a large part because uh, 70, 80 percent of the graves under the Kurgans are adult males. Yeah, right, right, right there. You you do not have a full demographic profile of the uh, population. Uh, and if all of those adult males are descended from the same clan, uh, there may be a whole lot of other adult males who are building Kurgans and listening to those people but are not represented in the archaeological record and they're not represented, therefore, in the uh, genetic um, yeah. uh, analysis. So, and, and this is an idea, I mean, I'm, right now we're, we're debating and trying to figure out how we can test these different alternatives. Um, uh, but one of the things that, that I see that's intriguing is that when Yamnaya people migrate out of the steppes into, they, they, you go as far as Western Hungary with classic Yamnaya graves and classic Yamnaya genetics, and then the spread up into Western and Northern Europe is, involves the corded ware culture where there's substantial admixture with um, local pre-Yamnaya people. Not a lot, but there's significant ad admixture. Um, and, and at that time, when corded ware emerges, there's a new dominant um, paternal male y group that emerges that you hadn't seen in the Kurgan graves in the steppes. And where was that hanging out? Who were those people, and where did they come from? So if there was a subclass, uh, that was helping to build the Kurgan graves. So once they got to the edge of the Yamnaya range and migrated across the Carpathians and went into Europe, perhaps they then became, you know, a turned back on their own Yamnaya ancestors, said we have new allies now, uh, 
uh, we have a new material culture, uh, and we have a new dominant uh, paternal haplogroup that's different from the ancestral. You could explain that, which did happen, you could explain that uh, if there was a mass of people who were not represented uh, in the normal Yamnaya Kurgan graze in the steppes. But yeah. you're, you're, when you're talking about negative evidence and a ghost population, you know, which is what which, what I'm talking about now, yeah. you're you're on thin ice. Um, well, terms... well, I mean, let, uh, let's make this explicit. Like you're talking about R1A versus R1B, the original Yamnaya, or not the original, the Yamnaya are R1B, the Aphnacevo are R1B, uh, the Bell Beakers tend to be R1B, uh, and then the corded wear tend to be R1A, right? And so, like, like wh where are the early R1A? That's what you're asking. Where are the early R1A and where are the Bellbeaker R1Bs? Um, the, yeah. uh, the Bellbeaker R1B is not the dominant uh, R1B and Bellbeaker is not the same um, yeah. haplogroup as the dominant R1B in the Yamnaya and the Steps. Yeah, and yeah. And estimates of the branching date between R1A and R1B and these various kinds of R1B suggest that they actually differentiated thousands of years before. Yeah. So that population with that, with that bell beaker type R1B was out there somewhere, but we haven't sampled it uh, until, until they show up in, <laughs> in uh, Western Europe. Yeah. Well, so, you know, um, I was actually, like, I was talking to Thomas Olander about this. Uh, so I was looking at the coalescence between uh, the Z93 branch of R1A, which is what I carry myself. Um, and, you know, it's been found in the Fontanovo, Balanovo culture in uh, European Russia. And then I think it's, like, the Z282, which is the dominant one in Slavic people today. And that's pretty much all you find in Europe, aside from, like, a few stray individuals. And, like, the coalescence there dates to about, like, you know, the midpoint estimate, 3,500 B.C. So even, I mean, even before the Yamnaya, there's structure within R1A um, that later partitioned into the European R1A and then the Asian R1A. And so I think what we're getting at here is, um, you know, there was this period of expansion, this revolution, this cultural revolution in a literal sense with nomadism. But there was a lot of stuff with, like, structure and tribes and clans. I mean, to some extent, we're never going to know because we don't have a time machine. You know, we're not going to yeah. – we can't interview these <laughs> – we can't interview these people. These are just kind of like we can talk about the generalities of, like, what's going on there. And so I was talking to uh, Thomas about, like, the differences between um, the different Indo-European languages. And, I mean, what is your assumption in terms of, like, did the Yamnaya 5,000 years ago speak Proto-Indo-European, or were they already differentiated into different dialects? I think the Yamnaya 5,000 years ago were the ancestors of all modern uh, Indo-European languages. The, the earlier split-off was the split-off of the Anatolian speakers. Um, I see. And, uh, and I think that all the rest are descended from Yamnaya. There's a and okay. it, and it, yeah yeah you, and actually it works pretty well with most of them. Uh, you can line up the phylogeny and the archaeology uh, pretty well. Uh, for for example, um, one of the problems I had before the genetics came out was uh, Tocharian speakers. Tocharian is an extinct language that was uh, documented in Central Asia in caravan cities and what is now Xinjiang uh, in Western China the easternmost uh, um, Indo-European language, and it's quite archaic, um, uh, and it looks uh, like Western European languages rather than the Indo-Iranian languages, which were also in the east. Uh, and then they're quite different, Tocharian and the Indo-Iranian languages. So I was looking at, okay, Yamnaya is the source of both of these. Presumably Eastern Yamnaya people left from the eastern edge of the Yamnaya world and migrated out to become Tocharians. And then just 1,000 years later, people from the same eastern part of the Omnia world migrated out to become Indo-Iranians. How did you get that dramatic a language shift right there in the eastern Yamnaya world uh, in 1,000 years? And that bothered me. But now the genetics show that the probable ancestors of the uh, Tocharian languages uh, were Yamnaya people who went to the Altai Mountains and are recognized there under the name of the Afanasievo culture, um, uh, while uh, the rest of the 
the Yamnaya people migrated westward into Europe, became courted ware, mixed with European farmers, migrated all the way back around towards the east through uh, Russia, south of the Urals, and then back out into Central Asia again to become Indo-Iranians. So the source of the Indo-Iranian languages is actually quite different from uh, the archaic Eastern Yamnaya uh, source of uh, the Afanasievo and the Tocharian languages. That's one of these things that, you know, bothered me before the genetics came out, and the genetics explained, although in a surprising way, uh, the genetics explained how those two Eastern languages could be so different. They're derived from completely different migrations. Yeah. Well, I mean, don't you think as a scholar, a surprising explanation is the best? You kind of resolve the issue, but it's also surprising and interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's fascinating. But who would have guessed that the Yamnaya migrations would go west into Europe, loop all the way back around, come back through Russia, and go all the way to India? Um, uh, uh, I, I would never have proposed that. It's, it's too complicated. Yeah. But it seems to be what happened. Well, so I, I mentioned this to Thomas uh, last week as well. Um, you know, when I started doing a mixture analysis with samples uh, with uh, South Asians, particularly upper caste South Asians, uh, Northwest South Asians, uh, there used to, about 2010, there used to be an artifact, quote unquote, an artifact, where a lot of South Asians would show a residual of Northeast European ancestry cluster. And um, I would kind of fiddle around with, with, with my parameter settings because that just made no sense, right? Right. <laughs> well, now we understand why. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, so that's one place where, yeah, so a lot of what used to be odd and unsolvable problems actually fall into place pretty well with the, with the DNA data. The DNA data has been uh, just a revolution for this in, entire field. And I think actually broad, more broadly speaking for archaeology in general. Archaeologists have always had a problem firmly identifying migrants in the archaeological records. You know, you can dig up a cemetery and, and uh, people are all buried in the same funeral ritual and which, which one is migrant and which, which are local or can you pick out a migrant? And now with the DNA, you can. You know, you can say this individual over here buried at the periphery of the cemetery actually came from 2,000 kilometers away. Um, and we never had that tool before. So I think it will... Um, open an entirely new era in archaeological interpretation. Well, so I, I have a question then um, from an archaeological perspective as an archaeologist. You know, I know archaeologists are very specialized in terms of what you know in your domain specificity, but I do get questions from Indians uh, who are skeptical of the Indo-Aryan migration. And, you know, their argument to me, and I don't know the archaeology very well, is, well, there's no archaeological evidence of migrants from the steppe in the archaeological record. How plausible do you think that assertion is? Can uh, nomadic people just have to just not leave a trace in the archaeological record because their material culture does not – they don't bring their material culture. Does that make sense? Yeah, but there, you know, there, there have always been um, uh, archaeological traces in uh, northern South Asia that uh, some people pointed to and said, well, you know, this could be them coming in. Uh, the gray ware, you know, or um, the, yeah. the Velker ware. Um, and it's just there's not that many sites. The archaeology of that period was not that highly developed uh, before. It's getting better with more excavations um, in South Asia. And and really, you know, the, the, the key for me is that we now have um, uh, in, I think it was in the Swat Valley, um, individuals who are 1500 BC and um, are um, heavily Yamnaya yeah. ancestors. Um, yeah. And re regardless of, of what their material culture looks like, that tells you they're coming in from uh, the Northwest. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the Sintasha people. Uh, so I have a, a, a question about the origin of the Yamnaya because I think people keep asking me about this and I don't know. So, as you said, you know, they're a mixture of Eastern European hunter-gatherers who themselves have some Western European hunter-gatherer, but mostly ancient North Eurasian, so kind of like the indigenous people. And there's a Caucasus hunter-gatherers. Um, can you talk about the ethnogenesis of the Yamnaya? Because they're very, very diverse in their origins. 
even if they're homogeneous within themselves, like when and how it happened, like you guys have a sense? Well, this is a, this is uh, the big project that I'm working on now. Um, and it's taking a long time uh, because we keep wanting to get more samples is the, <laughs> is the short answer to that uh, in order to solve problems that we face. But uh, there are these pre-Yamnaya cultures in the depths um, that uh, make a pretty good ancestral base for Yamnaya, uh, particularly the cultures uh, uh, in what was going to be the eastern Yamnaya range, the Volga, Don, uh, Ural uh, cultures going down to uh, the North Caucasus. Uh, that region uh, we have heavily sampled. Um, and uh, uh, you see the same basic uh, formula with EHG and CHG in these populations with a climb that goes from more CHG in the south to less CHG in the north. And then once you get into the forest zone, you're into pure EHG with no CHG at all. Um, uh, there is a cemetery called Khvalinsk. Uh, K, K-H-V is the first three letters. Khvalinsk um, on the Volga. Yeah. But I've just finished a um, uh, co-authored article about it's already been accepted by Prehistorische Zeitschrift, a, a German archaeological publication. So it'll be uh, available there, I think, within a couple of months, uh, at least on their website. Um, and Falinsk uh, uh, is the largest cemetery of the pre-Hamnaya era in this eastern region. Uh, and it has everything except the added ancestry from European farmers. It's just pure EHG and CHG. And you can see these two components coming together from the north and the south. The pre yamnaya population was admixing as a process between uh, northern forest-derived population coming down these ribbon-like river valleys and a southern-derived uh, population, population that we actually don't have the origin of yet. Um, okay. You know, uh, a pure CHG population. We have not found in the steppes, but they have to have gotten into the steppes from the Caucasus before 6500 BC, because after that date, it was a long time before Yamnaya, uh, because after that date, the populations in the Caucasus were admixed with Anatolian farmers from Western Anatolia. And the populations in the steppes don't have any Anatolian farmer at all. Uh, so this pure CHG had to have left the Caucasus before that admixture with Anatolian farmers happened. And uh, that, had, that had to have been before 6500 BC. By 6000 BC, people in Western Iran and the Caucasus and Anatolia are completely admixed with uh, Anatolian farmer and uh, CHG. Um, and up in the steppes, uh, you just get the CHG by itself mixing with EHG. So that's the the, you can say that this eastern region is the sort of the granddaddy of uh, Yamnaya genetics, much more so than, say, the Dnieper, the, the western um, uh, uh, range of the steppes north of the Black Sea, where the, where the uh, ancestry is more just uh, EHG and WHG without any of the CHG that, that clearly identifies Yamnaya. Um, so... Uh, the, the question, though, is you can see people who look kind of like Yamnaya in terms of their autosomal genetics, their nuclear genetics, their nuclear DNA, uh, a thousand years before Yamnaya uh, in, okay. the, in the space. But, but uh, so far, we haven't got the, the patriline, the specific patriline that's the Yamnaya um, y haplogroup in those pre-Yamnaya populations. We have uh, we have populations that are dated to 4,000 BC, you know, long before Yamnaya, that are EHG, CHG, and Anatolian farmer. Just the exact formula you would want for Yamnaya. Um, but um, so that's the kind of general population Yamnaya emerged from. I think we're going to understand that pretty well. We still haven't identified the specific uh, Y haplogroup, uh, pre Yamnaya Y haplogroup that looks like Yamnaya. Okay. There's a lot of different Y haplogroups out there. And uh, pre Yamnaya, so far, <laughs> none of them are the typical Yamnaya Y haplogroup. Um, well, so uh, I, I, want, I want to close up uh, talking about sex 
affect gender because it's kind of lubed over this conversation, and I, we haven't explicitly addressed this. Uh, Goldberg et al., I think 2018, she, uh, out of uh, no, Rosenberg's lab, came out with a paper that showed uh, a strong sex bias uh, in, uh, in the Yamnaya migrations into Europe. And uh, just looking at the Indian data, it's pretty clear that uh, the Sintashta came with their wives but didn't bring too much mtDNA. There is some in Pakistan, but um, as you know, just looking at the mitochondrial versus wives, just like totally different phylogenies in the Indian subcontinent, right? Um, yeah. And so, and so we have these 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 men migrating. Um, were the Yamnaya, you know, with their sky gods, with their, you know, Deus Pater and, and whatnot, were they like hyper patriarchal, just as patriarchal as everybody else? Uh, the reason I'm, I, I'm bringing this up is like, okay, so they domesticated the horse, they had this the wagon, and then they had these like cultural systems, and so they're all all bound up together. And you have this expansion of males, which is not entirely surprising. Like if you look at Latin America today, um, the paternal ancestry is quite different than the maternal ancestry, and that's because men tend to move across these long distances. Um, can you talk about like what your general model or idea of these migrations of these males are? And you know, there's some excellent papers you and your wife uh, put out about a, a ceremony. I think on the Volga region about the cannibalization of dogs. Like I'll put it in the show notes. It's just like really crazy, interesting stuff here. Uh, but can you speak to a little bit of this? Yeah. So what you're talking about there is we we excavate or decide on the Volga, Krasno uh, um, uh not far from the city of Samara, um, where we found the remains of an init- initiation ceremony, a, a boys' initiation ceremony, and to to, ex- to uh, ex- Explain how we came to that conclusion would take a long time, so various different strands of evidence. But uh, these at this site, they seem to have regularly, over and over and over again, practiced a winter season uh, ceremony in which they uh, butchered and chopped up dogs and ate them, which was not a custom of uh, uh, the people there at the time. Uh, the, so it was a inversion of normal eating practices just the way it would be for us um, all the dogs were male um, all the dogs were uh, older uh, familiar uh, probably pets um, and we've hypothesized that this all of the evidence fits together with something that's been put together uh, from uh, comparative indo-european mythology an institutional linguist had reconstructed which is uh, boys initiation into warriorhood in which they became dogs and wolves. There were also wolves involved in our sacrifices. Um, they became dogs and or wolves uh, in order to uh, feed the dogs of war, uh, go out and raid others um, and kill them, uh, and bring back uh, captives uh, and livestock. And I think we found the earliest evidence for it's It's not Yamnaya. It's dated about 18... 18- 1800 BC, but it's in the same a region of the steppes, and I think it's the earliest evidence that's been found for this kind of a institution. But many linguists uh, ascribe this institution, the um, dog and wolf-like youthful war bands, uh, being sent out and and being required to live away from home for uh, sometimes years at a time, uh, and exist by raiding. Uh, that could have been one of the uh, vectors for uh, the Amnaya expansion. And certainly in terms of migration theory, I was talking earlier about information streams. These boys would be an excellent way to acquire uh, information about potential uh, destinations and targets. Uh, and then the older men would then follow that up with um, large scale uh, migrations. Uh, as far as the gender goes, um, I uh, I think that there's mixed evidence in different parts of the world. It, you really have to look closely at the evidence in each different region. Um, uh, there's evidence that Yamnaya men and women went into Hungary. Uh, there's Yamnaya empty DNA there in the Hungarian graves. Um, and actually, during the expansion up into Corded, where it may have been Yamnaya women who were partially um, uh, uh, playing scout kind of roles or actual marriage kind of roles in making these migrations uh, possible. Um, in in Western Germany, it seems like there's less um, Yamnaya mtDNA. In Poland, it seems like there's more. 
The implication is that in Poland it was more of a tribal migration with the men and the women together. And in uh, Western Europe, perhaps the uh, migrants there mainly consisted of, of men who were going out and looking for local wives. Um, so I think that you have to, you have to uh, differentiate region by region in terms of what the gender mix was, and it depended on the time and place. I guess the, the general thing you can say is that there's certainly evidence that Yamnaya women went with the Yamnaya men in many parts of the Yamnaya uh, migration. Uh, not everywhere, but uh, I think it would be an exaggeration to say that the Yamnaya migrations were conducted entirely by unaccompanied men. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, I guess like a uh, last question, um, your book, uh, like what's, what's uh, you got, you, your agent has a drop date for you. When can we expect this? <laughs> Well, I've, I've got to finish the, uh, the, the Yamnaya Origins project with uh, David Reich Lab. That's going to happen first. Um, and okay. then I, I have been, uh, uh, the, the, my, my uh, initial title anyway is The Dogs of War. Um, and I'm hoping to produce a book uh, with that title. It'll probably, it'll take me a year or two to write it. Uh, so I'm thinking maybe in three years. And it will incorporate the uh, all the genetic evidence, and it'll also well, so incorporate I, the the material from horse DNA and these other projects that we're talking around, but I can't really talk specifically about now. Yeah, well, I mean, um, I mean that's that's a really good title, obviously. I, I, I'm sure, I'm sure that book will uh, will sell well, <laughs> at least to even <laughs> like display it on your coffee table. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So I, I do have I, I, a question uh, that I wonder about, though. Um, what do you think about the possibility of primogeniture and polygyny um, as driving some of the male-mediated biases that we see among the Yamnaya, like as an archaeologist and someone who knows the philological literature? Like, what do we know about the Yamnaya accorded where these early Indo-Europeans, um, were they monogamous? Were they polygynous? Were they facultative in terms of their behavior? I would expect that... Uh Primogeniture is not very common um, among the world's nomads. When you do, when you look at ethnographic worldwide studies of nomads ethnographically, primogeniture as a form of inheritance is more typical of farmers than it is of nomads, um, because the the herds are partable. Um, there isn't a, a piece of land that you want to keep together, um, and and herds can also grow. Uh, very quickly, uh, typically, uh, nomadic pastoralism goes through boom and bust cycles. Your herds can grow very fast, make you incredibly rich, and then you have a series of bad winters and you lose everything. Um, but, uh, and so it's a, an extremely dynamic kind of economy. And one of the aspects of that economy is that when you're going through a bust, somebody in another part of the grasslands might be going through uh, a good period, and you borrow animals from them to get you through, and that's the basis for usually in the world's nomads a, a loose form of hierarchy. And and we do see that in Yamnaya. But there's definite evidence of hierarchy in Yamnaya. Um, I wouldn't expect them to practice primogeniture. I would expect them to divide the herds among their sons. Um, okay. So yeah, that's good to know. Partable inheritance. That's that's. Good. Although the reason I ask is just uh, the star phylogeny, like the star phylogeny and the effective population size is different. Like there's just like a lot of there's. I mean, I'm sure your book will be fascinating. There's just so many things to talk about. I've I've kept you a little over long, but uh, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I know I did. I enjoyed it a lot, Rusty. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, calling. Um, I will be in touch, David. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. This podcast for kids 